Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part one of a four part interview series on the subject of reincarnation. With me is Dr. Walter Semkew, a medical doctor and reincarnation researcher. Dr. Semkew is the author of several books on reincarnation, including Born Again. Also, Return of the Revolutionaries, The Case for Reincarnation and Soul Groups Reunited, and Origin of the Soul and the Purpose of Reincarnation. In addition, Dr. Semkew is the founder and president of the Institute for the Integration of Science, Intuition, and Spirit. Welcome, Walter. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. We're old friends. We've we known are. each other a long time. Let's begin our discussion of reincarnation with the research uh, conducted at the University of Virginia, in particular by the late psychiatrist Dr. Ian Stevenson. Right. Uh, so Ian Stevenson is considered the pioneer of reincarnation research. For a period of 40 years, he traveled all over the world studying young children who had spontaneous memories of past lives. Mm -hmm. And he chose to study primarily children because he thought there was th the least chance of fabrication of memories. Adults can read books, they can read history and, and fabricate uh, memories. Mm -hmm. But when a young child, as soon as they can speak, before they can read or write, are telling their parents about uh, a past lifetime, uh, that's quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. And in the typical Ian Stevenson case, as soon as a child can speak, uh, they will tell their parents, my name's not what you're calling me. My name is so-and-so. And you're not my parents. My real parents are co gonna come and get me. And this is not my real home. My real home is in a village called so-and-so. And the child will name uh, uh, the give that their own name from the past lifetime, mm -hmm. the parents' name, uh, names of other relatives, and the geographic location of the past life home. And so the child eventually gives enough information that the biologic parents can locate the past life family. Mm -hmm. The child is then reunited with the past life family, can identify these family members by name that the child has never met before, know things that people only in the family would know, family secrets, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the child knows so many factual details that are correct, the past life family typically accepts the child as the reincarnation mm -hmm. of their deceased loved one. And as a result, actually, the biologic parents oftentimes are afraid that the uh, their child will want to leave them to, to move in with the yeah. past life family, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't occur. Though sometimes when the children are scolded by the biologic parents, they will threaten to leave and go back to their past life home where they're going to be treated better. I, uh, I but Stevenson mm -hmm. studied 2,500 cases like this over the span of 40 years. Mm -hmm. And about half the cases, let's say 1,200 of the cases, the past life mem memories could be factually and objectively validated. And that's what Stevenson called solved cases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the other hand, there were, again, about 1,200 cases where the past life family could not be located, mm -hmm. and as such, the memories could not be validated. Mm -hmm. But still, 1,200 cases a, is a large number. It's a big database. A big database. Mm -hmm. And Ian Stevenson was an extremely meticulous researcher. Uh, he actually was from Canada and started out uh, uh, focusing on biochemistry and and uh, medications mm -hmm. for treating depression and so forth. And then um, took a position at the University of Virginia where he became the head of the Department of Psychiatry mm -hmm. at the School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, his mother was a theosophist who was interested in a, a branch of spirituality where reincarnation is part of the belief system. Mm -hmm. 
So he was exposed to the idea of reincarnation. And then he started to hear about these cases of children who had spontaneous memories of past lives. And he took an interest in it and uh, wrote his first paper about one of these cases in 1960. And then with time, he got an endowment from um, the person who invented the Xerox Charleston. process, Chester. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Chester Charlson. And um, so he made a fortune on photocopying technology. And he gave the University of Virginia a million dollars. And you know this is back in the 1960s, where a million dollars was a lot more than now, mm -hmm. and, and uh, founded a permanent uh, chair for uh, Dr. Stevenson to do reincarnation research full time. And he worked with teams of researchers all over the world who would right. actually go out and investigate these cases and in the best of the cases the researchers would contact the families before uh, they had made any effort to verify the information that the child had provided. Right, and, and that's because it, the majority of the cases in the beginning came from countries where reincarnation was acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, the, there are significant cases from the U.S. Uh, recently in particular, but uh, it's thought that in places like, in the, like the United States where it's predominantly a Christian or Judeo-Christian uh, country, uh, if a child starts to speak about reincarnation, the, the parents will repress the memories or say, what are you talking about? Or mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, you know, to them it's the work of the devil or something like that. But in, in places like India or um, in, in Israel where there's the Druze culture where they mm -hmm. accept uh, reincarnation, uh, if a child starts speaking about a past lifetime, the parents are more receptive. And typically these cases uh, came from Asia in the beginning. Uh, the uh, child would speak a non-English language and the case would come to the attention of, of a lo local newspaper. Uh, the newspaper uh, would publish an article on this reincarnation mm -hmm. case and then eventually Dr. Stevenson would learn about this. And he developed a, a network of contacts all over the world um, who he worked with and they would funnel cases to him basically yeah. and then he would travel to those locations and he set up a methodology where uh, he said it was would be best to um, have the researchers present at the first time that the child is introduced to the past life family mm -hmm. so that everything could be documented who said what and who verified what statement mm -hmm. In fact, when he wrote his books, he wrote his books not for the common person, not for the lay person. He wrote it for academia. Yes. And sadly, uh, he felt like a failure because um, he felt academia never fully accepted his work. But uh, as being a medical doctor, mm -hmm. I don't find that surprising because uh, very few people that I know of in the medical profession or science in general have any interest in this sort of work, mm -hmm. uh, which I find quite baffling. But um, he wrote it directly for other academics. Yeah. So the way that he would put together a case is, in, in part, it would be narrative, but he used tables extensively. So he would have rows with each statement that the child made, mm -hmm. and then he would have columns with each witness. Let's mm -hmm. say there's 10 witnesses. So he would have this grid, basically, mm -hmm. where he would uh, indicate which witness verified which statement. Mm -hmm. So he approached it really like a lawyer in a court of law, mm -hmm. where, where he documented what every witness said. Uh, the difficulty, um, and, and he, he was a very intelligent man, he mm -hmm. used a multi uh, syllable so, so, how do you say it? he's words, words with lots of <laughs> syllables which is, i can't do and and uh and so his reading is very difficult yeah. and and so part of it is narrative part of it is in tables and it, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle to mm -hmm. kind of put the whole picture together yeah. you have to like piece it all together and and that's why so few people know about him mm -hmm. uh, i mean the wealth of of research 
that he's been put been able to put together is amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's also amazing how few people know about it. And and in my opinion, that's not only did he write in an academic style that made his writing out of reach for the average person. Um, over these 20 years that I've been doing reincarnation research, uh, I've realized that it's, it's an orphan because people in science generally are not interested in these topics. Mm -hmm. And I work with a lot of medical doctors who are smart people and they know about my books, but very few ever ask about it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, established religion doesn't want to touch it either because these cases show that you can change religion, nationality, and, and ethnic affiliation from one lifetime to another. Well, and, and there are many Ian Stevenson cases that show that. Mm -hmm. And he has cases where Muslims reincarnate as uh, uh, Hindu people, Hindus reincarnate as Muslims. There's a case where um, a Christian businessman reincarnated as a Muslim boy. Well, when, uh, first of all, let me say that's the main reason I put so much effort in getting this information out. Mm -hmm. Because once people realize, for instance, that Sunnis can be reincarnated as Shiites and vice versa, or that Muslims can reincarnate as Christians or Jews, mm -hmm. or that Jewish people realize they can reincarnate as Palestinian Muslims, first of all, all this fighting will stop. You know, I, I, I describe... Um, well, well, let me let me stop you there, because we're going to go into the uh, implications of reincarnation a little later, but I'd like to get into more the the database that mm -hmm. uh, Stevenson has accumulated. He has, as, as you point out, 1,200 cases that have been solved, mm -hmm. and I know you and, and other researchers have been very interested in what are the threads of uh, commonality that run through these cases? Well, um, what's really um, wonderful about these cases is not only do they provide solid evidence of reincarnation, but from the cases we can infer how reincarnation works. Uh -huh. Let me, l isn't it the case though that the ideal case that you described is rarely reached? Almost every case has flaws of one kind or another. They're not all so perfect. Well, uh, each, Different cases show different features of mm -hmm. how reincarnation works. Okay. So let, let's, uh, one of the principles of reincarnation, as I call them, is that people can have the same physical appearance from lifetime to lifetime. Okay. Now, uh, Ian Stevenson in the beginning did not pick up on that. Yeah. In fact, the first time he wrote that uh, physical appearance can be maintained from one lifetime to another was in 1997, mm -hmm. uh, almost 40 years after he started to do the research. And his first published cases with physical with photographs mm -hmm. showing physical resemblance uh, didn't come out till 1999. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't even in his own book. It was a book written by Tom Schroeder, who was who traveled with Stevenson to study the cases. A popular uh, account of Stevenson. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and uh, so perhaps I can describe two of these cases sure. that show physical resemblance. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them that's very striking is the uh, case of Su Suzanne uh, Ghanem. Mm -hmm. And I'll just do it in story form starting with the first lifetime. All right. So there was a woman named Hannah Monser who was born in Lebanon in the mid-30s. Mm -hmm. She married a policeman. Uh, they had children. She developed heart valve problems or some kind of heart problem, which I assume is a valve problem. And she was told by her physicians not to get pregnant again because her heart would not be able to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. uh, but she did get pregnant, and um, and at, uh, after the pregnancy, she had to go to have surgery. And they couldn't do it in Lebanon, so she traveled to Virginia mm -hmm. uh, where the surgery was done. She had a, a brother living in Virginia, and uh, and prior to surgery, she tried to call home, and in particular, to call uh, her daughter Layla. Mm -hmm. And she called multiple times, but could not get through. Mm -hmm. The next day she had, oh, and she told her brother to divide, if something happens to me and I don't survive, to divide my jewelry between mm -hmm. my daughters. 
and uh, she had surgery and then died the next day. Uh -huh. Just 10 days later, Suzanne Ghanem was born. Mm -hmm. And um, before she learned to read or write, she scribbled some numbers on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be the monster's phone number with just two digits transposed. I see. Uh, when she was a toddler, she would pick the phone off the hook and ask for Layla, mm -hmm. and she did this repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And her parents said, who's Layla? We don't know a Layla. Yeah. And she goes, that was my daughter. Mm -hmm. And they said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, ask me when my head is bigger, perhaps I'll tell you. <laughs> and and within a year, mm -hmm. she named her own name, Suzanne, I'm, I'm sorry, Hannon Monser, the name of her husband, 13 relatives in all. Mm -hmm. uh, w she named the place where she lived and gave enough information that her parents could find the Monser family. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, the Monsers were very skeptical, um, but... Uh, Suzanne was able to name all the relatives by name who she had never seen before. Mm -hmm. She knew about the jewelry being divided among her daughters. Mm -hmm. And her husband, Farouk, who's the policeman, uh, who found it very hard to believe that this, you know, five or six year old who's sitting on his lap being affectionate to him like mm -hmm. they're still a married couple uh, was his uh, deceased wife, but then he would show her pictures of them at parties. Yeah. And little Suzanne could name their friends in the pictures, mm -hmm. specific names. Mm -hmm. And he thought, how could she possibly know this? So they accepted that this little girl, Suzanne, is the reincarnation mm -hmm. of Hannah. Who was also born in Lebanon. Yeah, these are both in Lebanon. Not so here we have a woman who died in Virginia and was uh, apparently reborn in Lebanon. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about later that there's a lot of evidence that mm -hmm. souls plan lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Well, what's unique about this case and the next case, the Daniel Jurdy case, is there was a 30-year follow-up, which is very rare yeah. in reincarnation cases. And what happened is Tom Schroeder traveled with Stevenson in 1998 to um, uh, basically, uh, Schroeder was uh, tagging along to see how Stevenson researched cases, mm -hmm. but they also revisited two cases, mm -hmm. including Suzanne's case. Yes. So now about 30 years has gone by, because Stevenson first studied Suzanne in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. He goes back in 1998, and now Suzanne's a full-grown adult, and physically she looks exactly like Hannon. Mm -hmm. And we can show those. Yeah. Images. And the, the Daniel Jurdy case, which I won't take the time to go into detail, is a parallel case, mm -hmm. also from Lebanon, uh, had full memories as a child of mm -hmm. his uh, past lifetime. He told his kindergarten teacher his uh, name was Rashid Kadij, and even pinched his teacher like he was still the full-grown Rashid, you know, trying to, you know, hit on his teacher. <laughs> and and, and uh, um, gave enough information that, that uh, Lil Daniel was reunited with the Kadij family, identified family members, uh, they they accepted him as the reincarnation mm -hmm. of their deceased loved one, and and then they would even keep a cot for him at their house, mm -hmm. and once a month Daniel would go and stay with his past life family. Well, Stevenson studied uh, Daniel in in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. When back in 1998, Daniel's now a full grown adult, and he looks exactly like he did as Rashid Kadic. Mm -hmm. And in both these cases of Suzanne Ghanem and Daniel Jurdy, they both have very unique bone structure, facial mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. and th the faces are virtually the same. Mm -hmm. Well. That's one of the hallmarks of uh, the work that you have subsequently done, is looking at physical resemblance. Right, right. And, um, and, and I have my own kind of case. I got into reincarnation research mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to um, understand a possible past lifetime of mine, and mm -hmm. that started in 1995. Mm -hmm. And then I started to go to past life regression conferences, and I encountered multiple cases where uh, facial resemblance was evident. Mm -hmm. And so I actually uh, made the observation of the physical resemblance 
before Stevenson ever published anything well, about Well, and today, the uh, Division of Personalities and Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia continues this, yes. wor uh, this work. My understanding is that they themselves don't yet fully subscribe to this notion of uh, the, the facial uh, resemblance and similarity. At least they seem to feel that there well, are many cases in their database where that does not occur. Yeah. Well, Stevenson was open to that, yeah. and in his book where biology and reincarnation intersect, yes. he specifically states that mm -hmm. researchers in the future should look at resemblances in facial features. Let's talk about his work on birthmarks. Then. And and that's that's a perfect lead-in, yeah. because when Stevenson started to work on these cases, uh, many of the cases involve people who died by violent means, yes. uh, gunshot wounds or stab wounds. Mm -hmm. And so what Stevenson noted is that when these people reincarnated, they had birthmarks or scars mm -hmm. at the exact same anatomic location uh, where the past life personality had the wound. It's also worth noting, I think, that uh, a very high proportion of children who seem to remember their past lives experienced a violent death. Right, and, and there was that um, hypothesis that these children remembered mm -hmm. their past lives because of the violent nature of the death. It was yeah. like the trauma of the death uh, emotionally mm -hmm. led to the preservation of the memories. Yeah. What do you think of that? Uh, well, that that I think is quite possible. Mm -hmm. But Stevenson also has cases where people died of natural means in mm -hmm. old age yeah. and still had memories. So mm -hmm. it's and still reincarnated in, within two years. Mm -hmm. But the the point that I want to make is that Stevenson uh, only had autopsy reports to study in the beginning. Yes. Because many of the cases, the first personality, the past life personality, was born in the 1800s. Yeah. And many of these cases were from poor villages in India or Burma and other places mm -hmm. where people did not have cameras. Sri Lanka. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and first of all, you know, camera technology was just being sort of invented in that era, mm -hmm. and 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 people in remote villages would never even heard of a camera. So they didn't really have the means of they ascertaining didn't have the uh, if there was or was not a physical resemblance, exactly. a facial resemblance. But everybody who died of a traumatic wound had an autopsy. Mm -hmm. So Stevenson had, he didn't have pictures, but he had access to autopsy reports. Mm -hmm. And he studied the, these in great detail, and in his books he has pictures and shows the tra trajectory of the bullet and how this matches the, the wound on the the, the reincarnated person, and even did statistical analyses on what's the odds of having a birth birthmark here, and he mm -hmm. calculated the square footage of one's skin, mm -hmm. and you know came up, you know, the statistically this is like uh, beyond coincidence, mm -hmm. uh, and and I believe the reason that there was not more recognition of similarity in facial features is simply the pictures weren't available. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the Stevenson does have about 50, Stevenson has five cases where there are photographs that show physical resemblance. I described two of the cases. Yes. But there are about a total of 15 cases where physical resemblance mm -hmm. is reported. Mm -hmm. And But even in those cases, different witnesses may vary on their perception of whether there's a similarity. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you want me to talk about the snow case. Well, we only have a couple minutes left uh, in this segment, Walter. Okay. But one thing I would like to focus on is uh, the, the fact that Stevenson as a psychiatrist may well have been, and, and I believe was, interested in the possibilities that reincarnation might offer for uh, an understanding of psychiatric conditions. Well, um, I would say that's pretty much limited to phobias. Mm -hmm. But but um, that's about the only psychiatric condition. But since we only have a little time left, yeah. 
since this segment we've been talking about physical appearance, yes. let me just briefly mention that um, Robert Snow, is, he's a retired police captain. Yes. He was, uh, uh, how much time do we have? Less than two minutes. Okay, I'll, I can do this. So uh, Robert Snow, uh, he's retired now, but he was a police captain mm -hmm. in charge of homicide and mm -hmm. organized crime mm -hmm. for the city of Indianapolis, a big yeah. city. And he went on a past life regression on a dare, yeah. had 30 memories of a past lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, was able to verify that lifetime, wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. I was in the audience in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. He said at the end, I have proven reincarnation and if this was a court case, we would win without plea bargaining. Yep. And somebody in the audience said, well, do you look like Carol Beckwith, the past mm -hmm. life persona? And Bob said, well, there's pictures of, of uh, Carol Beckwith in my book, but I don't think I look anything like him. Mm -hmm. Well, I ran up to him and said, let me take pictures of you and I will show you that you look like Beckwith yes. and he himself was amazed when you take pictures in the right pose mm -hmm. and put them side by side mm -hmm. then you can uh, you have to look at two-dimensional images to two-dimensional images right. and if you don't you might not see the similarity in bone mm -hmm. structure mm -hmm. but the point is that it the physical similarity not, may not be apparent obvious. or yeah. obvious mm -hmm. at first yeah. you really have to put the pictures side by side well, that, that's uh, very interesting, and of course we could have a lengthy methodological discussion of what's required to actually compare facial structures, but uh, that'll have to occur on another occasion. Okay. Uh, we're going to have three more interviews, and we'll go into a lot of detail about uh, reincarnation uh, as we progress. Walter, thank you so much for You're welcome, sharing Jack. this half hour Good with to me. see you again. And thank you for being with us and be sure to check your listings for part two of our four-part series with Dr. Walter Semkew on reincarnation. <laughs>